Good morning. It's good to see you all today. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to do something really interesting today. I don't need notes today. Um, if you'd like to change, uh, turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Um, I love stories. I love stories. I, you know, I did not grow up reading books. I grew up, um, and my, my parents are fantastic. I love them very much, but they just, they weren't readers. So they never encouraged us to read. In fact, I think the very first book that I really remember reading, I was in sixth grade and my older brother, uh, was assigned The Hobbit. And I, you know, he was like, I hate reading this thing. So I picked it up and I devoured it, you know, and I just suddenly went, this is amazing. And from there on out, I could not stop getting enough of stories. It's why I like movies. I love a good story and why it annoys me when you have these great st- movies with all this blockbuster graphics and the story is horrible. It's like, what's the point? I love stories. I love stories. And and what I found really interesting, especially as I went through college, is, is, I, is I was taught really how do stories work? And it's interesting, all stories actually function the same way. There are certain pieces that are in every story. And once you can see that, it suddenly, it just explodes in significance and meaning. For example, every single story has a setting. All stories have a setting. And it might be once upon a time. That's a setting. It's, it's, a, it's a place. And, and they always have characters. And there's the main character, who could be a hero, it could be a villain, but there's one guy in which there's the story revolves around, and then there's a bunch of support, supporting characters who might have their own issues and stuff, but it all centers around one person. There's a plot. There's always a plot. And the plot begins in the very beginning with this introduction where the setting is set up and the characters are introduced, and the, the main problem that the hero of the story has to overcome is set up. And the plot goes basically like this. It starts off with what is the characters, what are the, what's, what's the issue, and it builds, and at some point in the story, there's a m- critical moment which the hero either succeed or fail. And then from there on out, it's just, how does it resolve? What are the effects of that moment where the hero will either succeed in whatever the problem is, or he'll fail? All stories fit these same categories. All stories do. So think about, you know, whether it's the Three Little Pigs, or it's Star Wars, or Casablanca, one of my favorite movies, whatever it is. Um, Wizard of Oz, you know, Dorothy is the main character. The setting, depending on how you read it, is either Kansas or it's the Land of Oz. And, her, and, and she has a cast of characters, right? She has this, she has the scarecrow and she has Toto and she has the lion and and while they may have their own issues, it all revolves around Dorothy getting home. That's the issue. It also could be her dealing with her home life, but that's a, but the point is is there comes a moment where she will either defeat the witch, she will either get home or she won't, and she of course does. And after the witch has been defeated, it's all kind of just working out of that issue, and she goes home and that. That's the story. The Bible is a story. Your life is a story. You have a setting. There is a main character of your story. There are villains and there are heroes. There are supporting characters. And there is a central problem. And the question becomes, who is that main hero? And what I would like you to hear for today is that you are not the hero of your story. You're in the Bible. Every human being is in the Bible, the story of the Bible. But God is the hero of the story, not us. He is. And your story, much like those choose your own adventure path, remember those old stories? You know, depending on which way you pick, the story ends up one way or the other, whether you fall down into a pit or you, you know, whatever it is. It's a good ending or a bad ending. You too have that choice. It depends on how you relate to the hero. 
But what's, what's the hero's job? What's the conflict? Well, we're going to look at that today as we read through this chapter here in Revelation. I'm going to actually read the entire chapter. We're, we, we talked about the first half of chapter 4 last week, and I'll talk about it just a little bit today. But I want to really, we're really going to focus from 6 through 11. Let me read it. Let me read it. Verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door stood standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking up, speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. Around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones. And seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and back, the first living creature like a lion, the second creature like an ox, the third living creature like with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures... Each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The first couple of verses, John goes to heaven, and he sees in the center of everything someone on a throne. He's the hero. Everything in this chapter, as we were to continue to read on to verse chapter 5, everything is in the, cent- in the center of everything is God. Revelation is the last book. It summarizes the Bible. It's the conclusion of a story. How many stories have you read, movies you've seen, where... It's a great story up until the end, and then they ruin it by the ending. Lots. That's because the ending is so critical. It's supposed to resolve all the issues that have occurred up to this point. And when it doesn't, you go, well, that was a waste of two hours. But that's not the case here. It clarifies what's been going on through the entire book. It gives you a perspective. It gives you a perspective. And much like if it's a wedding, the minister is comes up and he takes his place. And from that place, everybody knows their place to stand. It's the same thing. Everybody, God is in the center, and based on where he is, everyone has a position they're supposed to take. He's at the center. He's the heart of everything that's going on in all of the Bible. He's the hero. But how are we supposed to resolve him, respond to him? I mean, we look here in these first couple of verses, and we see God's great, indescribable glory, verse 3. We see his incredible, inherent majesty, verse 4. We see his his awe-inspiring, terrifying, incredible power, verse 5. And his holy transcendence, not like anything else described with the sea in verse 6, the first half of verse 6. And then we get into these, these weird creatures, don't we? These weird creatures in 6, 7, 8. What is the deal? Well, remember it's apocalyptic language. An apocalyptic language is meant to be symbolic. 
It's inherent in the style. Would you ever make a cake and read it like you would read a novel? Well, no. A recipe is not meant to be read like you would read Charles Dickens. And you wouldn't read Charles Dickens like you would read the tax code. Now, would you? That would really not work well for you. That's because we know that different styles of writing is meant to be read differently. Now, it doesn't mean you can just mean it whatever it means. No, these, these symbols have clear meanings. You just need to know what that means. You know, you need to figure it out. So John means what he means. And so what we need to read here is not, not that these are literal expressions of exactly what he looks like, but these are spent, meant to communicate to you attributes of these creatures. They're meant to communicate what they are, not what they look like. And so we start here in verse 6. On each side of the throne, there are four living creatures, full of eyes, front and back, behind. Let's just start with that. Eyes in the Bible have to do with perception, understanding. And so these having all of them, these living creatures, they're near omniscient. I'm not going to say they're omniscient, meaning knowing all things, because only God is. No other creature is. But they're close. They see everything. They understand everything. Nothing escapes their notice. That's the concept. Everything about God, they are, they are focused on him. They see it, that nothing escapes their view. That's, the con that's what's going on. And then he communicates, the first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, and then another one is like a face of a man, and the fourth living creature is like an eagle in flight. So you have these four creatures, and each one has a different attribute. One looks like a lion, and one like an ox, one like an eagle, one like a man. And if you stop to think about these, especially if you consider it at the time, they all represent creatures that in the natural world are just about the highest you can get. Like for, for a first century Jew, what would be stronger than an ox? Nothing really. I mean, that's power, right? What's more noble than a lion? I mean, he's the king of the beasts. He represents nobility. And man, the smartest, the wisest, the most intelligent. Eagle? What's faster than an eagle? These four represent, and their characteristics, represent the highest qualities in the most extreme level of the created world. That's the point. That these creatures are the greatest created thing God has made. They, they, they're, they're, their attributes, as it were, are the greatest there is. In part, you can see that just by the proximity to the throne. They're closest to God. Because they're most like God of all the created beings. And of course, still, the, the separation between them and God is an ocean. But they're the closest of all that God has made. They're the most like him. The greatest of all created beings are these four creatures. The greatest of the wild eye, the greatest of the domesticated, the greatest of the air. They're the greatest. And and they have six wings, right? That's what it says. Now, if the, the, these descriptions, they really are takeoffs. They're quotes, almost quotes from two places in the Old Testament. One is Ezekiel chapter 1, and the other one is Isaiah 6. Now, in Isaiah 6, these, these creatures are called seraphim. And there he goes, Isaiah sees the picture of, of, of God and specifically, actually, the Messiah, Jesus, on his throne. And, and they're flying around the throne. And it says there that two cover their face, two cover their feet, and two fly. And what is that all about? Well, God should not be looked at. He is too holy, so they cover their face. God is exalted, and they are humble, these creatures, so they cover their feet. And they're quick to obey. So they fly. That's the idea. 
These are humble creatures, even though they're the greatest. They recognize the holiness of who God is, the greatness of who God is, so they don't look. But they will obey in an instant when he asks them to do something. That's what these creatures are. They are the greatest of all the created world. And what do they do? These created creatures, these closest to him, well, look at the text. What, is, what are they doing? What are these creatures who are, are beyond everything else? Verse 8, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes, all around, within, and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They never stop worshiping. Let that sink in. The greatest things that God has ever created spend their entire existence worshiping God. There are other things they do. If you read through this book in a couple of different places, one is chapter 6, verse 1. They'll speak, they will do some things, but as I understand it, it's an expression of this. So when they, in chapter 6, verse 1, say, I heard one of the four living creatures with a, with a voice like thunder say, come, and, there, and a white horse comes out. So they're doing stuff, yes, but it's, that's, that they're expressing, they're declaring that God is holy, that he is the Almighty. They're, they're worshiping by doing stuff, but they worship without stopping. The closest to God, they worship incessantly. They're about him. He's at the center of their lives. And more than just worship incessantly, notice they lead others in worship. Look at that. And when at verse 9, and whenever, oh, just a moment. We're, we're, we're going to look again at this, this, this phrase, holy, 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 but I'm going to do that in two weeks, um, along with the quotes for the 24. So I haven't ignored it. I'm just, it's not the point today, okay? Note, the point I want you to hear is that they worship, all right? Verse 9, and whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, see, that's what they're doing. They're giving glory to him. They're giving honor to him. They're giving thanks to him who is seated on the throne. Whenever they do that, the 24 elders fall down. The highest of creatures, they give glory to God. They give honor to God. They worship God, and they lead others in worship. You want to be like the greatest of all creatures, the greatest that has ever been created? Then do what they do. Give honor, honor and glory to God and lead other people to do the same because that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. Let's look, at the, look, let's look at the second group here, these 24. Now, 24, um, it says that the 24 elders fall down, and I just want to briefly pop back up to verse 4 to remind us about who these people are. Um, remember at that point we were talking about there's the throne in the center and then you have the sea of glass and around the sea of glass is these 24 incredibly majestic beings, whether they're humans or angels or spiritual beings, that's really not the point at this point. The point is, is that they're majestic creatures. They are the highest of all of God's creation in terms of authority. Their throne is the closest to his throne. The people who are the most have the most authority in God's creation, the people who are the most majestic, they have crowns, they have righteousness, they have white robes. These, that's who these people are. They magnify God's authority. But wh who, what are they doing? Whenever they, they do this, the, 20, the, 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 the four worship, the 24 fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him. They fall down and worship. 
And this fall down, it, it means a couple of things. Among it is it's a declaration that he is their God. It's a, it's a humility. It's a, subs, it's a being um, submissive to him. It says that they all throw their crowns before him. It's, it's, it's the communication that my crown comes from you. I am a, you are my Lord. You are the one I will obey. You're the one that I will follow. You are the, where my authority comes from. That's what they're saying. And it's exactly what their, their words say. Were there are you to receive glory and honor and power? The creatures who have the greatest glory, greatest amount of honor, the greatest amount of power, the greatest majesty, what do they do with, their, with that? They say, you deserve it. Because you created everything. You are the creator. And by your will, they exist. Why do we exist? Not just that you were created, but you exist currently. You are sustained right here, right now, because God decides to have it happen. This is what he's saying. And so really, it's very, very simple, isn't it here? These, these, these verses are really straightforward. John goes up into heaven. He sees, the very first thing he sees is God at the center of everything. And the very highest of all the created world, the greatest in glory, the great, most like him, the greatest in power and authority, all of them, what do they do? They worship. Their orientation is to him. He is at the center. Worship is the only right response to God. And not worshiping rightly is the central conflict of Revelation and of the Bible. It leads to all the other sins. Is putting something or someone else on the throne. That's the core issue. When we go back to Genesis and you're introduced to the main character. He's the first one who speaks. He's the one who's doing all the action in Genesis 1 and 2. And the conflict he has is this, this, this creation that he loves dearly. And he's made everything right. And, and Adam and Eve are doing, they're rightly relating to him. But they mess it up by deciding they're going to listen to someone else. And they're going to put someone else on the throne themselves rather than him. They listen to the serpent. And so the rest of the Bible is all about that. It's what Paul is getting at in Romans chapter 1 when he's listing all the issues and, he, and he's describing humanity's primary plight, their primary problem, and it says that they've exchanged the glory of God for the immortal God. And because of that, on down the list is every other sin that our society sees, right? All of it. Why is there a problem in this world? My dear Christians, you should never ask the question and without having the answer of what's wrong with the world. You know what's wrong with the world. You know. That's not a debate. The Bible is extraordinarily clear with it. People aren't relating to God rightly. And so everything else is why things are wrong. But God loves this creation. He loves you. He loves these good people. And because he's good and he knows not worshiping him is what's causing all the problems. So we did something about it. That's the, that's the arc. As, 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 as humanity continues to get further and further away from God, as we read through the Bible, it gets bad and worse and then worse and then worse. And then the, the cross is that cr the climax. Will God, when Jesus steps on the stage, will he actually fix the world? Will he win against sin? Will he win against death? Will he win against the powers of darkness? And he does. And from that moment on, it's all about, okay, now how's that going to get resolved? 
That's the story. It's the story in Revelation. We're going to see how it's resolved in chapter 5. But that's the story. That we have chosen to orient our lives wrongly. And if I may be blunt, us Christians at times are no better than the rest of the world. What do you worship? All of this leads you with just the two questions. Next week, we're going to answer the first of them, which how does God fix the world? And we're going to see it's Jesus. Big shocker, right? You know, why are you, you know, don't weep, John. The lion is conquered, right? And boom, the result of all that is worship, okay? Things get back the way they're supposed to be. That's chapter five. But the other question what we're going to start talking about in two weeks is, if worship really is that critical, and it is, then how are we supposed to be worshiping? See, mission needs to occur. People need to come to Jesus. Why? Because worship is not occurring. Worship isn't occurring. Because something, because we are oriented, if this is God, we're oriented every other way than focused on him in the heart. And so the question I just want you to wrestle with this week, just wrestle with this, is what are you worshiping? And for that, I actually do want to have a quote. There's a long quote by an, a guy named Louis Giglio, um, fantastic preacher. Some of you know who he is. And he, uh, he's written extensively on worship. And I kind of just want to end with this thought here. How do you know what you worship? And his answer is this. It's easy. You simply follow the trail of your time. Your affection, your energy, your money, your allegiance, and that en at the end of that trail, you're, you're going to find a throne. And whatever or whoever is on that throne is what is of highest value. We pause there. So look at how you spend your time. Look at where you spend your money. Where's your highest value? Where's your highest uh, allegiance? Where do you put your energy? That's what you value more than anything else. And on that throne is what you worship. Sure, not many of us walk around saying, I worship my stuff. Sure, I worship, I don't, my, most of us don't walk around saying, I worship my job, or I worship pleasure, or I worship her, or I worship my body, or I worship me. But the trail never lies. We may say we value this thing or that thing more than any other, but the volume of our actions speak louder than our words. In the end, our worship is more about what we do than what we say. And that's what we see with these, 20, these, these, these four living creatures. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and then they back it up by doing what he says. They're oriented to him. And this might feel disoriented. You might go, I don't get it. But I really want you to, 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 to hear that just like that wedding party, if you stand where you're supposed to stand in relation to him, you're where you're supposed to be and things go right. Can you imagine having a wedding party where the, the minister comes and he takes his place and the bridegroom comes and stands some weird off place, not even oriented at all towards him? Wouldn't that be not right? How would that wedding party go if the if the groom is facing this way and the and, and the and the bride is facing this way? It doesn't work. Your life doesn't work if you're not rightly oriented to him. It's good for you to be put Jesus at the center of your life. It's right. It's what you were designed for. 
It's what you're meant for. And anything else is like putting diesel in an unleaded car. It ruins the car. So don't do that. Live with him at the center of your life. It doesn't mean that's all you think about, but it's of what your highest priority is, what your greatest treasure is, is him. Be like the greatest of all the created creatures, the most majestic of all them, and worship God alone. And if you find this morning that you have not done that, then chapter 5 is an incredible encouragement. Because for you and me, who at times go, Oh my Lord, I have done it so wrong. Jesus comes and says, But I paid for that sin. Just come back home. Come back home today if you have found that you have not lived rightly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, and I thank you for your goodness in Jesus that we can come back to you. We find, I find, mm, the older I get, the more my heart is not oriented rightly often. And so, Father, I thank you that you love me as I am. You love me. You sent your son, Jesus, as I was disoriented, worshiping the created thing, sinning as a sinner. You sent him at that moment for me. And thank you, Jesus, that you love me. And you love me enough to pay for that sin. And Spirit, I am so grateful that you convict us, that you move us, that you lift our eyes and say, Oh, my child, look this way. Help us to look the way you're telling us to look. To look to your son to look to you, Father, and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.